Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Change Podcast. Today, I'm very excited to introduce this topic and our special guest. We are going to talk about conscious businesses. And here I have with me my really good friend. Her name's Anna Choi. Hi, Anna. Hi, Linda. Hi, everybody. So Anna is a conscious business coach who helps her clients transform and focus their energy to attract more customers in less time and also scale their impact on the world. Her key message is creating a new normal economy based on the quadruple bottom line, which I'm very curious to hear more about. So let's welcome Anna for this podcast. Yay! Yes. So Anna, first of all, how do you define a conscious business? And is it different from a social enterprise? Very good. Um, so it's kind of like not all squares are rectangles, but some rectangles are squares kind of thing. I don't know if I said that right. <laughs> um, so yes, sometimes and no, sometimes not. So conscious business is simply if you're spiritually conscious, which means you're highly self-aware or uh, socially conscious. So you care about social impact. And a social enterprise has two definitions or two criteria according to the Social Enterprise Alliance. But honestly, it's defined differently everywhere. I could not find a norm after lots of research. So I'm just using their definition, which is you're both purpose-driven and then, so you have some sort of mission and you're a revenue model. So you're making money. So you're not solely based off of donations like a typical nonprofit you might think. So that's a social enterprise. So all social enterprises are, uh, all conscious businesses are social enterprises, but not all social enterprises are necessarily conscious businesses because they could be a nonprofit. I see. Does that make sense? Yes. I think it's a really cool trend lately that uh, companies have been taking on to be socially responsible. And I think the consumers these days, because we're being more open to environmental friendly options, to sustainability, more people are interested in those kinds of movements and actions that the consumers are actually demanding the companies to become more socially conscious and yeah. responsible. It's antiquated, not to, frankly. I don't think it's some trend. It's just how business will be done. <laughs> if you want to stay relevant. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Marketplace. Yes. So now I want to ask you, so what is this quadruple bottom line that you are an expert in? Yes. So, uh, again, there's not any consensus for what the, the quadruple bottom line actually is. So I have coined this term for myself to mean the four P's of people, planet, profit, and presence. And usually that fourth P of presence is missing, but I think it's one of the most critical. Um, you will see a lot of stuff on triple bottom lines of the wrap purpose in there, they'll wrap all these other P's in there. Um, but those I believe are the foundation to really create a new normal economy. So, I really like conscious businesses and I feel like uh, more people are trying to take their business that way because as we mentioned, the trend is going that way and it seems like that trend is here to stay. So something that I personally have trouble with and I think maybe some other people in the audience might have trouble with is if I have a good heart, a good mission, a good purpose, can that really translate to profit? Because not necessarily when I have the best intentions, best heart, does it bring me the results that I really want? (laughs) Is this something that's truly profitable? And if so, how can people who are just starting out or interested in creating a consciously aware business take it to be something that's profitable? Very good. So yes. (laughs) I like it yes just do it yes (laughs) yeah I'm like I'm like having a good heart doesn't somehow predicate like you don't have to be business savvy like you need both so we kind of I think it's indicative of our dichotomy thinking like good heart or money and that's just so old I mean it's a yes and and it's necessary because how can you still make that difference and impact if you're not making money and bringing money through the door and so the old nonprofit philanthropic model is around, is around. It'll probably be around for a while, and it's it's antiquated of it. So that's why people are starting to think, what's my revenue model as a nonprofit or business, whatever entity. So the bottom line is, you got to figure out an exchange value between who you're serving. So whatever that mission is, great. But what's the exchange value? Like, what are people going to pay for that's valuable? 
that's it. That's all business is. It's very simple, but harder to do than just get that. And how can you find it for someone who has trouble kind of grasping how, what that service is for them? Do you have any tips that you suggest that they can really find their sweet spot niche marketing? Well, they have to really get a clear understanding of their um, target market. So I have a whole video on niche versus target market because <laughs> there's distinctions, but I won't go into it super in depth other than to say, who do you serve? And it seems like a simple answer, but man, it is not for many, many, many people. Yeah. So sometimes, especially if you get into the social enterprise world, there's the beneficiaries who may not actually be your market that you're selling stuff to, <laughs> whether it's a product or service. So first number th one, one thing is you really have to define your target market, not your niche yet, um, which niche can apply to both a specific product to a to a broad rate of people or can be a specific person with the specific product, which is probably too narrow when you start out, right? So don't worry about any of that. All you have to worry about is who do you wanna serve? And I have this like little Venn diagram that I usually use. Like it's a sweet spot between who you have experience working with as a population or a category or community of people or group of people. And then you can brainstorm who you have, who do you just enjoy being around? different than who you might have had experience with. And then you can look at who actually you think has money. <laughs> if you want to support all the students, but you have to come up with an offering that would fit that and do lots of volume of it. Um, and so I said four, but I'm just gonna say three for now. So you just need like a, the sweet spot between those three areas to start to brainstorm. Okay, here's where I can really make an impact. They have money. I've got some credibility in this group already. Mm -hmm. What are some examples of social enterprises that we can see out there of companies that you think from your professional experience are doing a really good job of being profitable and have a good purpose and serve the community and doing all of that very well? Have you heard of Patagonia? Yes, I love Patagonia. <laughs> right? You go right on their thing. It's not on the very front page, but if you go into about, it just says like, we're in business to save our home planet. Mm -hmm. Boom. Mission clearly there's a revenue model selling other stuff right they are very good about making sure everything's sourced you know that they're not using slavery that you know all those they're using sustainable resources um tom's shoes boom <laughs> <laughs> yeah they were actually the first company that i saw that i saw growing up that really did the whole like one for one like social campaign that kind of changed how companies uh base their base their like model off of I was like, look at this. I brought some examples. <laughs> this bar saves lives. It's like, buy a bar, save a life. I How cool it. is that? So that model, buy one, give one, is one of the popular models. Um, there's other models of like, just having a regular business, but you're employing people who can't find employment, like homeless people, incarcerated people, et cetera. So I can name you tons of examples locally here, um, but worldwide as well, that employ those kinds of people. So another question that I as a consumer also have is um, this idea of voting better with my dollar. I've heard that term kind of thrown around in many places that, you know, the people have the power, not the corporation. So you, as a consumer, you should vote better with your dollar. But I feel like it's... Um, it's a lot of work to like <laughs> a lot of work to dig and see what they're all about. When all I want, I'm hungry and I just want, <laughs> I just want a, 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 a cantaloupe. I don't know if this was, you know, picked by child slaves. Like I, I you know what I mean? So totally. How, how can a regular there. consumer like me who has a desire to help the world, who really wants to support companies that have a good mission, but maybe I don't have all the information or maybe I just don't have the time or maybe I don't have the patience to look through all these companies. How can I exercise better voting with my dollar for someone like me? Okay, two answers. So in the moment, like you just gotta grab something, just buy local, that's like the shorthand answer. You're gonna be providing jobs, the, the supply chain is probably gonna be good. Just see if you can buy local, right? And then, the farmer's market? Yeah, it could be the farmer's market. It's weird because it gets convoluted in the grocery store. If you like actually ask where everything's from, you're like, what? I thought this was local. It's like from like Mexico or California. <laughs> They're all um, local to North America. <laughs> I know. It's like 
everything's so convoluted sometimes. But so yes, farmers markets, that's an obvious one. Um, I'm trying to think of the grocery store. You can, I, at least at our stores, you can see like the co-ops. Co-ops are good to shop at. Um, they say like, you know, you can read their story or see where they're from and see if it's local. And it doesn't have to be like local geography. Like it could be also just a small business. So like, you know, I, I know people can market things different ways, but normally you can tell, right? Like if I'm buying eggs, I get the happy chickens, <laughs> right? They've got pictures of the chickens like in their grass fields and stuff. With sun Which is just organic even, right? Cause the yolks are different. Mm -hmm. like much, much happier chickens and it's a lot more expensive, but. So are right, there. Yeah, are there tips that you adopt in your own life where you make your daily purchases more mindful, even if it's something very small? Yes. And this is funny that you say that because I was going to say the other thing, sorry, you have to do the research. Like it does boil down to that. So for certain things that you know you're going to use a lot and over and over, I do take the time to research. And there's like a ton of apps. If you like go online, it can be like the top 20 plus, right? So yes, we prepared for this. <laughs> so I have all these props, but there's this floss that's amazing. <laughs> and I didn't know, but floss is like made out of plastic and petroleum. And you're putting it on your mouth and then you're like putting the trash, it's like it's tangled around animals. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like what's biodegradable? So this is silk, it's biodegradable. You can put it in the toilet or whatever. It's just called dental lace. I'm not like an affiliate with them or anything, but <laughs> I just was trying to look for something Warning, sometimes they're kind of, it breaks. So you have to find a good spool, but it does function well. Otherwise, as a glass container that you can use over and over and over and just get refills for. So yes, every single item in my house, like my shoes, my toothpaste, my snacks. I mean, it is getting easier and easier from even five years ago to have most all your common things somehow sustainably. It's not, don't try to be perfect. It's just about doing your best, you know, sometimes I make a shop at Walmart <laughs> or somewhere. And I'm like, I hope you know. But you know, you do you do your best with as many items as you can. Mm. So I know your area of expertise is coaching people and having your own conscious minded company. So by having that consciously aware company, I'm sure you've run into some obstacles. I'm sure you've had your triumphs. What would you say are some of some of the personal experiences that you've had? Like, what are some difficulties of running a conscious business? What are some great things about running a conscious business? Mm -hmm. And what do you hope, what kind of impact do you hope to have on the world by coaching the way you're coaching? Mm -hmm. Well, so that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll see if I can remember them all. So what challenges as a conscious business is the lingo. Like every, some people are like, what's conscious? I'm awake. And I'm like, well, kind of. <laughs> um, I find people, my niche, that's my, my target market is conscious, right? They either get it or they don't get it at all. And then there's a long learning curve to educate. So that's like a big challenge is just making sure we're on the same page and a lot of people are conscious but don't realize it they wouldn't call it that you know so the, and it, so an agreement on terms and jargon is also difficult because you need a common language right. I just picked conscious from some research so um, that's been a challenge another big challenge I see from I do this free mentoring with the Social Enterprise Alliance which is a national org brings together social enterprises and um, they have really funky mod business models because they're thinking so outside the box. It's just not traditional. So that's a little difficult to um, support because there's no infrastructure for those models to happen. The more money they're making or success that they're having personally, like taking care of themselves while they're actually running their business is going to make the world a better place, which I think then answers your like other question around What's really rewarding and fulfilling is knowing that every, you know, saving one life or it's not it's saving the planet one business at a time kind of thing. Where if if that one business gets more conscious, not just of how, what they are buying, but how they're serving, who they're serving, what they're offering, that has a ripple effect, right? So there's a very magnanimous kind of impact that gets to be made 
versus just, I'm gonna help you make lots of money. Like whoop de doo why, why bother, you know? Um, so that's very fulfilling. And I, the access, I think for planetary consciousness and really uplifting the vibe, you know, of all humanity is to, um, you know, it starts with us. It starts one person at a time, starts inward. I'm just a guide, so I'm, I'm really helping them look within to discover their own answers. And I give advice sometimes, obviously, but um, it's really awakening to their, unleashing their own potential of the biggest impact that they want to make in the world. And what would you say is the most common question for, from the people that you coach who are wanting to take their business to a consciously aware business? A, a common pattern I see is energy management. <laughs> um, they are now burned out do-gooders. Same problem as if you're only focused on profit. So that's still a problem. <laughs> and what's critical is everybody has 24 hours, yet why are some leaders able to make a good jillion more impact with the same amount of hours? Is it really being more productive? Or is it that they've learned to manage their energy well? And I would argue it's the latter. So that's the, what I hear a lot is, or I see as a pattern is people not managing their energy, giving all their, they're giving outside themselves. And then they're not gonna sustain as a business. Then they can't make the difference they wanna make. So I gotta put the Oscar mask on you first and then the business. <laughs> So what advice do you have pe for people who are like that? Who are just give, 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 give. They have such a good heart. They just want to help other people, but then they get burned out. Yes. And one of, um, a lot of my clients, when we're going to our little accelerator, one of the first things we tackle is what's the one thing that nourishes your soul every day. And they get a list and you can make your own list of, I don't look at any other things on Brain Education TV. <laughs> There's many ideas of what nourishes you. So some people it's, a walk in nature, others, it's being with your child or reading in bed. It could be just meditating and breathing. Whatever it is for you, just commit to one thing and then uh, commit to a time frame. Like start, just start off easy, like five days, seven days, <laughs> every day without fail. And then you can either increase or pick a new thing. Um, but that starts to re remind you that you have all the power within to you're the one designing your life <laughs> take back your own power right right instead of just serve 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 i think a lot of people who are in the the business of serving just tend to just give 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 because we're natural givers natural lovers natural healers that we forget about ourselves totally yeah very common yes so i'm curious what tips do you have for someone who wants to start <laughs> a conscious business or might be interested in transforming their current business into something that's conscious. Yes. So whether you identify as conscious business or not, um, we can put a link maybe below here, but there's a free link um, and it's to take the 4P pledge. And that's just a simple, it's like four statements like, yes, I will be a global citizen. Like we're all one. <laughs> and yes, I'll be a conscious consumer and do my best, right? To shop local and so forth or, or whatever that looks like. Um, and so that's one action. And then the second would be, we have um, on my website has a ton of free resources and blogs and videos around all of this conversation. And uh, if I know this is going globally, but locally it's always good to have, we have events as well, but there's, um, there's lots of resources to just meet up with other conscious businesses. I think that's really important so that you have a community, you don't feel like the lone warrior and realize, oh wow, this is a bigger movement and a bigger uh, community. So my last question for you is, for, for the doubters out there, for the people who are still not, <laughs> not really sure or not really convinced on this idea, why should we go conscious for a business? It's a risk not to. <laughs> and and if, if you believe that, then can you explain what you mean by that? The short answer is if, if you are a company that's like, I'm just gonna make the most money and destroy the planet in the meantime, <laughs> I mean, it's gonna run out. Like A, 
there's like a finiteness, a scarcity to something. And then number two is there, there, there won't be a market soon for it. So those are just like basic business things you have to be mindful of. Um, the amount of social, we call it impact investing. So sustainable, responsible impact investing that's come through the U.S., not the U.S., but even globally. It used to be um, like 20 years ago, one in every $10. Ten dollars, you know, was invested that way. It's now up to one in four. It's twenty five percent. That's like a tipping point. Um, that's huge. I mean, it's, in the last decade, I've seen it. Like, you know, Morningstar has an ESG rating, which ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. So it's looking like how many women on the board, like your supply chains, all that stuff. That's like a new metric that all portfolio money managers have to look at to see if they want to bring more investor dollars into your portfolio. Like it would behoove you to do that. Now there's also escalated pressure with the media, right? Like there's a big old thing around palm oil and how they're taking away all the rainforests. But if you uh, are gonna get super bad press, <laughs> it's kind of the, carrot, the stick versus the carrot, right? But if you, you won't survive as a business, so I mean, who knows if they would have done it on their own, out of their own good heart, but the palm oil kings that were like, you know, kicking off the indigenous from their lands and all this stuff. They all agreed, okay, yes, 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 we'll do sustainable practices because they're getting such bad press. So it's happening, like whether you admit it or not, it's um, it's it's out there to be as a force to be reckoned with to do business. And I really believe we're moving from the informational age of information overwhelm and the internet age, right, into impact age. And so, I mean, the whole country of Japan is like, the whole government's around the society 5.0, which is reflective of now Entrepreneur 5.0. Um, I'm borrowing that from Roger James Hamilton, who's one of my business mentors. And it's all about that hybrid of the high touch, high tech, and being able to have impact while making lots of money. It's just, it's, it's no longer dichotomous. It's, it's really instrumental to, to come together. So, I mean, just do all the research, like social entrepreneurship. It's one of the hottest courses now in colleges. Like there's, I could go on and on <laughs> and maybe I'm a little biased, but <laughs> you just kind of, if you step back and just look at logically all the facts that are happening and the trends, it's, it's not inevitable. It's just highly like likely and predictable given the millennial generation and that women are the highest decision makers purchasing and it's going to continue to grow as the generations age out and phase out. So it's coming. <laughs> you better be ready. <laughs> right. or, versus be a poser and a bad gender. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the with the rise of, you briefly mentioned about this, um, so much access to information, so much access to things that are happening in our society that companies can't hide anymore. You know, just one search in, on Google and you can see so many things that we did not have access to before. So uh, I feel like nowadays there's more power to an individual to choose something that you know makes me feel good buying or makes me feel like i'm making an impact maybe indirectly by supporting a company that is doing good for the planet so as you mentioned i really believe that you know it's obvious that our resources are becoming more limited on this planet uh, it's no doubt that climate is changing weather patterns are being crazy there's earthquakes happening like crazy things are shifting and i feel that as people who if you really do want to help other people, which I feel at the essence of all business, like we're in it to help other people, you know, to provide a solution to a problem. So I really, really hope that every business can adopt a conscious business model and become a company that becomes more socially aware so that we can, you know, still enjoy life, but not completely destroy the planet in the process. Because without the earth, we have no place to even make money. If that is something that you want to do without the earth, there's no place to do your business. And that is fact. Yeah. Well said. Yes. So do you have any last tips or advice or things you'd like to share about the topic of conscious businesses and what you do as a conscious business coach? Yeah, just, just when you get that link below to the 4P pledge, that'll take you to an assessment. So you can just quickly see in the 4Ps how you rate. And then don't worry if your score is like super low or high, but just commit to a higher score and commit to like two or three actions that you could take differently instead. 
because it starts with you. So don't wait for other Fortune 100 companies or the government or whatever to, to take action. It begins with you. And I think our generation these days knows that more than ever. So that's a real simple, easy way to start taking actions and then share it, share the pledge, share whatever so that other people can jump on this presence movement as well. Yes, and what you just said kind of reminded me of something else too, that don't forget that the people are the ones who have the power. I know it's easy for us as a consumer, including myself, to think that, oh, these corporations have more power than me. What can my little, little dollar vote do to impact society at large but actually companies need to meet the demands of the consumer because if the consumer stops supporting a company then that's like cutting off their resources and then also for for a kingdom i want to ask the audience out there who do you think is more important the king or the people many people might say the king because the king has power but actually can the king be a king if he doesn't have any subjects to rule over Without the subjects, the king is just a human, just a person. But without a king, the people can be just fine. So that's just, that's just principle and law. The people have more power, whether you realize it or not. So don't forget, you are important. Your choices and your decisions impact the world and other people way more than you think. So don't ever think that what you're doing does not matter because you matter. Yes. Well, thank you, Anna, so much for spending time with me to talk about this. Yes, it was so fun. Yes, and I'll link all of uh, the ways to get in touch with Anna and what she mentioned, the different links. I'll link them down in the description below. So please check it out if you're interested in connecting with her and working with her as your socially conscious business coach. Then I'll include a link down below to do that as well. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye.